Tonight, breaking news, the deadly shooting at a Cancun resort. The new images of guests huddled in the lobby of a five-star hotel after suspected drug dealers opened fire on a beach packed with tourists. Guests running for cover and hiding in rooms. Tonight, the recent outbreak of violence in paradise and what we've just learned from police. Also tonight, vaccine mandate fury after the White House announced more than 80 million U.S. workers in the private sector will have to be vaccinated by January 4th or get tested weekly. Florida's governor already saying he'll join a lawsuit with Alabama and Georgia as more than a dozen states threaten legal challenges. The country already seen widespread protests to vaccine mandates. Thousands of New York City first responders now on unpaid leave. Plus, the outrage over the jury selection at the Ahmad Arbery trial. Only one black juror selected in the trial of three white men accused of chasing and killing Arbery through a Georgia neighborhood. That chilling video capturing his final moments. The judge saying there appears to be discrimination, but the trial is continuing anyway. Deep freeze, more than 100 million Americans experiencing bitter cold temperatures with frost and freeze alerts stretching from New Mexico to New England. How long is the cold expected to last? Officer choke suspect, the Colorado police officer arrested after body cam footage shows him placing his hands around the neck of a handcuffed suspect, the charges he's now facing. And growing questions for Aaron Rodgers, the star quarterback testing positive for COVID-19. So has he been violating league protocols all season? Top story starts right now. And good evening tonight from Los Angeles. I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story with breaking news. A deadly shooting at a resort in Cancun. The new image is just in. Check this out. Frightened tourists packed into the lobby of a Hyatt hotel after police say suspected drug dealers opened fire on the beach. Guests rushing inside with video showing several people hiding in the hotel's basement as well. Other guests barricading themselves inside of their rooms. You can see that right there. Police say two people who are presumed to be those drug dealers are dead. We have NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer, who's live on set with us here on to at Top Story. So, Miguel, walk us through this. What, what is Mexico law enforcement saying right now? Well, Tom, it's still a developing situation, but here are some details that we do know tonight. We know the attorney general in Mexico says there was an altercation between several drug dealers on a beach when shots were fired near the Hyatt Zia Riviera Cancun Resort. A local news outlet is reporting at least eight gunmen then entered the hotel carrying long guns. The commotion sent tourists scrambling, as you can imagine. Images coming into NBC News show some taking cover in the resort's corridors and later guests gathering in the hotel lobby, reuniting with family. Mexico's Secretary of Public Security says two people died, as you mentioned, both believed to be drug dealers. At this hour, it appears no tourists were injured, and the gunfire, we believe, Tom, is over. And Miguel, one of the reasons why we're leading the broadcast with this, because one, it's very terrifying. A lot of Americans vacation there, but this is not new. There was a recent shooting where tourists were caught in the crossfire as well. Yeah, just a few weeks ago, Tom, and this is something that happens from time to time. Of course, Mexican police try to keep the strip of Cancun incredibly safe. That area depends on American tourists and tourists from all over the country. So it is an important area and they have more security there tonight and tomorrow, Tom. Yeah. And then I have to ask you, what is the hotel exactly saying about all this? Because these resorts thrive on tourism. It's essentially the only industry in Cancun. The, ho the hotel statement's fairly limited, but what they're saying right now is that their guests are their top priority. Safety is their top priority. That's something they'll be addressing in the days to come. They're making the point that this shooting did not happen at the hotel, but that guests ran there for safety, Tom. All right, Miguel Almaguer leading us off tonight here on Top Story. Miguel, we thank you for that. All right, the other major headline we're talking about tonight, the swift backlash over a sweeping vaccine mandate. The Biden administration announcing that companies with more than 100 employees will have until January 4th to ensure that their work workforce is fully vaccinated. Those who refuse will have to undergo weekly testing. The announcement met with fury. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis called it an abuse of power. He's among lawmakers in at least a dozen states now threatening lawsuits. It comes amid widespread pushback on mandates for municipal workers. Thousands of first responders in New York City off the job tonight. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. After months of vocal opposition, yet remarkable compliance, the new COVID vaccine mandate covers a staggering 84 million people, two-thirds of the U.S. workforce. 
It requires companies with 100 or more employees to ensure they're either fully vaccinated against COVID by January 4th or tested weekly. The order does not require employers to pay for the tests, though union agreements might require some employers to foot the bill. The idea behind this is not to spend hours and hours and, and a lot of public money in court. The intent behind this is to get the health and safety of workers in the workplace, uh, put that front and center. U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh says the rule will be administered by OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Fines could reach nearly $14,000 per violation. How exactly do you plan to enforce this? Yeah, OSHA's done this work for over 50 years, uh, and employers know uh, the way that the, to work with OSHA on this thing. Starting December 5th, covered employers will also be required to give workers paid time off to get vaccinated, as well as sick leave to recover from side effects. Today, during a Senate hearing, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky and Dr. Anthony Fauci defended the Biden administration's COVID response. We know that mandates work. If you look at, for example, the percentage of people in United Airlines or in the Houston Medical Association or in other organizations that have mandated, it works 99 plus percent. But mandates remain a flashpoint across the country. From Los Angeles today. No one should lose their job over a vaccine mandate. To Lynchburg, Virginia this week, where dozens of workers walked off the job. We would like to have the company actually sit down and talk and come to the table with clear, open, honest communication. Tonight, some states are planning to sue the Biden administration over this latest mandate after already doing so over a previous requirement for federal contractors. In Houston, Brian Felco is the CEO of a supply chain logistics company who's concerned about employees leaving in a tight labor market. I have real mixed emotions because on the one hand, you know, I know that the vaccine is our one-way ticket out of the pandemic. And on the other, there's a certain reality of, of managing our employee bases and running our companies. And those two may be on a bit of a collision course. We're going to find out. All right. And speaking of collision courses, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. Gabe, what about states like Texas that have laws or executive orders banning vaccine mandates? Yeah, Tom, the Biden administration says that because this new rule is under OSHA, it supersedes any local restrictions. But of course, opponents will no doubt take this to court, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, live from New York for us tonight. Gabe, we thank you for that. We turn to politics now, new pressure on Democrats and more division over the president's massive spending bills. Both Democrats and Republicans now using this week's election results to support their arguments. Kristen Welker's at the White House with the latest for us tonight. After the dismal results for Democrats on Election Day, new urgency tonight on Capitol Hill. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying she wants a vote on President Biden's two multi-trillion dollar spending plans by the end of this week. We're going to pass both bills, but in order to do so, we have to have votes for both bills, and that's where we are. Pelosi pressed by NBC's Garrett Hake on whether Democratic inaction was to blame for the Election Day debacle. Do you think Democrats were penalized for having not gotten these things done? There's no question. If we, uh, the more results we can produce in a way that is people understand in their lives, the better it is. It comes after Republicans won stunning victories in Virginia, including for governor and lieutenant governor. And in deep blue New Jersey, the AP now projecting another surprising upset. The powerful Democratic state Senate president. Hello, my name is Edward Thur. I'm running for New Jersey State Senate. Ousted by a little-known Republican truck driver for a furniture store who shot his campaign videos on his phone. Moderate Democratic Senator Joe Manchin arguing the Republican victories are a sign voters don't want to rush into more massive spending. People are concerned. They're concerned about inflation. They're concerned about the debt. No, no, we don't talk about it, but they are concerned. But progressives say the takeaway is just the opposite, that voters want them to go big. And now they're backing Pelosi's last-minute decision to put four weeks of paid family leave back into the president's social spending plan, despite the fact that Manchin has signaled opposition. Millions of women across the country are outraged that one man would say we're not going to do paid leave. But tonight, top Republicans argue the election was a rebuke of those Democratic proposals. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's, these yeah. people are governing like they have a mandate to radically remake the country. It's build back socialism.
All right, Kristen Welker joins us now from the White House. Kristen, I want to go back to something we just saw in your story there, that announcement by Nancy Pelosi that paid family leave is back in this massive spending package with Joe Manchin still opposing it. So walk our viewers through what exactly the Democrats think is going to happen. Well, they are going to try to pressure Joe Manchin, the sole holdout, to back paid family leave. But even if he doesn't, Tom, the fact that they have put it in this House package could politically benefit those House Democrats that supported it. And also tonight, top House Democrats are trying to secure the votes to pass both bills. But some moderates remain hesitant. We've learned President Biden is making phone calls to try to win over those holdouts. Tom. NBC Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker for us tonight. Kristen, thank you. We turn now to the Ahmad Arbery murder trial. Three white men in Georgia accused of murdering a black jogger last year. The case now facing even more controversy because only one of the 12 jurors seated is black. NBC's Ron Allen is on the ground in Georgia. He looks like Ahmad Arbery! Ahmad Arbery! Tonight, passion running high in the community where Ahmad Arbery was shot and killed almost two years ago. Anger, only one black juror was selected to decide a case that Arbery's family supporters have called a modern-day lynching. It was very disturbing to find out that we had one African-American versus um, 11 whites. Do you still think you'll get justice? I do think with the evidence that the state has that we will get justice for Ahmaud. Gregory McMichael, his son Travis, and a neighbor, William Roddy Bryan, faced nine counts each, including murder, aggravated assault, and attempted kidnapping. Accused of chasing, shooting, and killing Aubrey, they've all pleaded not guilty. Now, after questioning hundreds of potential jurors in a county that's about 26% black, 11 white and one black juror selected. The defense using its legal challenges to eliminate 11 potential black jurors from the jury pool on the final day. This court has found that there appears to be uh, intentional uh, discrimination. He added Georgia law prevents him from taking action because the attorneys gave reasons other than race for the dismissals, like insisting the prospective jurors could not be impartial. That's really what the court has to decide. Are those race neutral explanations that were offered, are they satisfactory? And in this case, the judge said that he did find them to be satisfactory. Now, prosecutors expected to cite Arbery's race as a significant factor in his death. And the defendants expected to say they are attempting a citizen's arrest of a robbery suspect, acting in self-defense. All right, Ron Allen joins us now from Brunswick, Georgia. Ron, this trial already getting off to a controversial start. What do we know about the timing of this case and when we, might we see a verdict? Well, the judge has told the jury to expect the trial to last two to three weeks. Everyone seems to hope that it ends before Thanksgiving, but that seems to be optimistic when you consider the fact that jury selection took two and a half weeks, and that usually just takes a couple of days. There is a lot of emotion, a lot of passions around this trial. There are a lot of people who think these defendants are guilty. There are a lot who think they are innocent as well. You'll remember that we are up to the fifth prosecutor in this case because so many people know each other in this community, and there's even one prosecutor who's facing criminal charges because of her role in the initial stages of the case. But the bottom line is that opening statements begin tomorrow, and then we'll see from there. I expect that every step along the way, there will be fights about witnesses, testimony, documents, you name it. It's going to be a very hard-fought battle. Tom? Ron Allen for us tonight from Georgia. Ron, thank you. We want to turn now to concerns overseas. A chilling new Pentagon report is highlighting China's growing military power, including its rapidly expanding nuclear arsenal. NBC's Lester Holt asked Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, if the U.S. is in danger of losing an arms race with China. Do we have the capability to match what we just saw from China? Well, I won't go into anything classified, but I would just say that that test that occurred was a very significant test. In my view, we're witnessing one of the largest shifts in global geostrategic power that the world is witnessing. All right, we want to talk about more with this with NBC's Pentagon correspondent, Courtney Cuby. She joins us now from Washington. So, Courtney, this new report says China is accelerating its nuclear weapons program. How quickly is this operation growing? 
So this is an annual report, and just for perspective, last year's report at the same time said that China had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 200 nuclear warheads, and it projected that over the next decade, they would roughly double that number, so somewhere around 400. Well, just one year later, the same report says that, in fact, China could have 700 nuclear warheads by 2027, and by the end of this decade, they could have somewhere around 1,000, so a real a significant increase in how fast they are producing, they expect it to be able to potentially field nuclear warheads. Beyond that, though, Tom, the report also warned about China's intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities, saying that they are really growing both their arsenal and the ability to uh, to uh, fire those and, uh, and actually carry out ICBM tests and potentially launches. Now, this, of course, all comes on the heels of the U.S. military acknowledging that China tested a hypersonic missile over the summer, one that flew extremely fast and extremely far, Tom. Yeah, so, Courtney, so how much should we be worried sort of of China ramping up this arms race? And I know you, you've talked about the hypersonic missile just now and how dangerous it is. Yeah, that's right. So what was so different about this test was just how far this hypersonic went. It's not a surprise that China has these hypersonics. We've known that. And the reality is the U.S. is also trying to field a hypersonic missile. But what's so concerning and what we heard from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs earlier uh, with our colleague Lester Holt yesterday was that, that – China seems to be pulling out ahead of the United States. They are really making rapid advances in their hypersonic technology. And not just that, General Milley also warned about their artificial intelligence and other technology and said, look, the United States needs to, needs to catch up or they will be, the U.S. will be behind China in the coming decade. Tom. All right, Courtney QB at the Pentagon tonight for us. Courtney, thank you. We are also tracking the weather tonight, the deep freeze sweeping across the country, tens of millions in the path of frigid temperatures, record snowfall in the Great Lakes and torrential rain in the south, plus towns facing snowplow driver shortages as the winter gets underway. Jack Brewster reports. Tonight, more than 25 million people under frost and freeze alerts nationwide. Weather has dipped a bit, so we're getting out the jackets. The first snow of the season falling in the Midwest and Northeast. Nearly a foot of snowfall setting a record near the Great Lakes. Suddenly it just got to like 20, 30 degrees, and now we're just trying to make it work. Little Rock, Memphis, Nashville, Charlotte, and Raleigh among the cities facing down this big chill. With more than 106 million people experiencing temperatures at or below freezing. The entire Mid-South under a freeze warning between 1 and 9 a.m. heading into Friday morning. So again, cover up uh, any tender vegetation. Lake effect snow coming down overnight in Jamestown, New York. The state's first measurable snowfall of the season. And a storm system threatening the south. Rain coming down in Texas. But as the cold weather ramps up, some areas worried they won't have enough snowplow drivers to handle it. This is a, a problem that's gone on the last few years, uh, and it's getting worse. In Massachusetts, several towns facing a shortage of drivers, one offering up to $155 an hour for workers. I can't uh, respond to the needs of the town and the community that I work for, and then who's going to fill that void? All right, Shaq Brewster joins us now from Chicago. And Shaq, you know, usually we expect the weather to get this cold, but in a lot of parts of the country, it's starting so late in the year. Great point. Chicago didn't experience its first freezing temperatures until about two days ago, which was about two weeks later than the average, which is about October 19th. But that makes sense. We saw across the country and especially here in Chicago that October was one of the warmest months on record. It actually broke records in cities like Baltimore, Syracuse, Toledo, Ohio, uh, when you saw temperatures about five to nine degrees above average. Tom. All right, Shaq Brewster tonight from a chilly Chicago. Shaq, we thank you for that. We head to Colorado now to the officer arrested after police released body cam video appearing to show him using a chokehold on a woman. He's now facing an assault charge after a fellow officer reported him. Issa Gutierrez has more. This body camera video from Colorado police appears to show a woman spitting at an officer and the officer reacting like this. Spitting on me? Now that officer is facing a second degree assault charge after a sergeant reported him. This happened in Sheridan, Colorado back in September. 
where a new state law requires police officers to intervene when others use excessive force and to report such incidents. The law is part of a police accountability bill that was passed last year in the month after George Floyd's murder in Minnesota. I'm proud to see law enforcement officers stepping up, speaking out and saying, you know what, it's not, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to change the way that our culture is. According to a statement from the Sheridan police chief, the woman detained in the September video was a shoplifting suspect. After getting off the ground following the incident with the officer, she's led to a police vehicle. Right, we're going to sit in the car so you don't do that again. Later, you can hear police talking about her condition. Is she complaining of injury? When she went, I said, oh, my head, my head, okay. I hit my head. Police issued a statement saying she was cleared at the hospital with no apparent injuries. Police also say the officer facing charges was immediately placed on administrative leave following the incident. All right, Issa joins us now live from 30 Rock there in New York. Issa, I want to know a little bit more about this law that was passed in Colorado last year in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Yeah, Tom, so in the state of Colorado, if an officer uh, does not intervene or does not report an incident where another officer uses excessive force, they can be charged with a misdemeanor. Uh, by the way, Tom, we did reach out uh, to the officer, Officer Ralph, who's facing the charges, and he did not respond. We did also reach out to his attorneys. They declined to comment. Okay, Issa, thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, more alleg allegations of set sabotage. The armor for the film Rust reinforcing claims that someone may have put real bullets in a box of dummy rounds before Alec Baldwin fired a fatal shot. Plus, the search tonight for a missing mother who disappeared while looking for her son. The grisly discovery just made suggesting foul play may have been involved. And Aaron Rodgers sidelined after reportedly testing positive for COVID-19. So the question is tonight, was he unvaccinated and has he been violating the league's protocols all season? Stay with us. Back now with more accusations of sabotage on the set of the Alec Baldwin film Russ, the armorer echoing her lawyer's claims, saying someone may have mixed in real bullets with the dummy rounds. Miguel Almaguer again for us tonight. Tonight, the armorer from the movie set Rust, making a new statement about the Alec Baldwin shooting that left a crew member dead. Hannah Gutierrez reads lawyers doubling down on claims there was sabotage on the set, saying no one could have anticipated that someone would introduce live rounds into this set. Her attorneys had first indicated a live round had been intentionally mixed in with blanks without the knowledge of Gutierrez Reed. Are you suggesting that this is a case of sabotage? The answer is conclusively and unequivocally yes. Investigators are not addressing the new allegations of sabotage, but Tom asked the district attorney what theories they were pursuing in the death of Helena Hutchins. Is this simply a case that possibly one live round got mixed in with either dummies or blanks? Is that what cost Helena her life? It, that's it's very like it's very likely that that is something that that's one of the scenarios that we are exploring and it is likely that that's what happened. Attorneys for Gutierrez Reed first stating the revolver and ammunition were left unattended for two hours later clarifying it was five to ten minutes but they do hold to their assertion that crew members who walked off the job the morning of the accident had a motive to tamper with the rounds. Attorneys for the 24 year old armorer who's in charge of weapons on the set Saying, I believe that somebody uh, who would do that would want to sabotage the set, want to prove a point. Camera operator Lane Looper says he and others walked because the set of rust was unsafe. What do you make of those allegations? I mean, I find them to be, I find them to be incredibly irresponsible allegations and slanderous. He blames corner cutting for the death of Helena Hutchins, which the production company called patently false. 
All right, Miguel joins us again now live on set. You know, Alec Baldwin has said the movie has shut down. Is it going to be hard for investigators to re-interview witnesses? It's not going to be as easy as they'd like. At last check, Alec Baldwin was still in Vermont. Uh, the, the armorer lives here in Los Angeles. The assistant director lives in Phoenix, or I should say in Santa Fe. And a lot of the people that took part in this set are all scattered across the country. Everyone is apparently cooperating in this investigation. It's going to be a matter of getting people back to the sheriff's department, which could take time. Yeah, and so many people want answers right now. All right, Miguel, we thank you for that. When we come back, violence on board. The number of unruly passengers at an all-time high. Now, dozens of those cases turn over to the FBI. And Nicaragua preparing for a presidential election while the U.S. and other countries are already opposing the results. Stay with us. All right, now to Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the search for a mother who disappeared while looking for her missing son. Glenda Parton was last seen over a week ago in Tulsa County, Oklahoma. Her car was found on the side of the road the next day. Officials say she was looking for her 59-year-old son and his friend Jack Grimes, who has since been found dead. His death ruled a homicide. Authorities say all three people are involved in the horse business, and they are not ruling out foul play. The FAA says it has submitted 37 unruly passenger cases to the FBI for criminal review. The referrals are in addition to civil penalties and any criminal charges brought on by local authorities. The agency says more FBI submissions could be on the way as they continue to investigate the nearly 5,000 reports of unruly passengers this year. And a major headline from the health world, a new study finds HPV vaccines cut the risk of cervical cancer by nearly 90%. The U.K. study finding the first-generation vaccine also significantly reduced the risk of precancerous changes that can be caused by the virus. Researchers calling it a, quote, historic moment. And it's that time of year again. This year's Rockefeller Center Christmas tree has been picked. The 79-foot-tall Norway spruce will come from Elkton, Maryland, about an hour and a half north from Baltimore. It's the first time the tree will come from Maryland. The spruce will arrive in New York City on November 13th after a 145-mile journey. It's 50,000 LED lights will be lit up on December 1st, and you can watch all of that on NBC. Turning now to a major headline in the sports world, Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers benched this week after reportedly testing positive for COVID. Questions now mounting about whether the quarterback was ever vaccinated and if he's been violating NFL protocols. NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett reports. Tonight, new questions swirling over NFL star Aaron Rodgers about whether he broke the league's COVID rules. The quarterback sidelined this week after multiple reports that he tested positive for COVID-19. He was asked directly whether he had gotten the vaccine before the season began. Are you vaccinated and what's your stance on, on vaccinations? Yeah, I've been immunized. Um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of conversation around it, around the league, and a lot of guys who have made statements and have made statements, owners who made statements. Um, you know, there's guys on the team that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, I think it's a personal decision. I'm not going to judge those guys. But ESPN reports the NFL has been treating Rodgers as unvaccinated since the beginning of the season. Rodgers has not returned NBC's request for comment. By the NFL saying he is out for this game, that was the code word for the fact that he has not been vaccinated. The Green Bay Packers announced the quarterback cannot play this Sunday because of NFL COVID protocol guidelines, which means he'll sit out for 10 days. I went, wait, they're clearing, they're calling him out already? And that's when I started to go, wait, does that mean he's not vaccinated? The NFL does not require players or coaches to be vaccinated, but if a player does not get a shot, NFL protocol says those players must wear masks inside team facilities, get tested daily, and wait 10 days before returning to play after a positive test. The final score and, and also... But if Rodgers is unvaccinated, he seems in violation of rules. He's been without a mask at press conferences and also on the sidelines at games. If he is found to have violated these policies, will he face any consequences from either the team or the NFL? He will face some financial consequences, but they're not severe. He can be fined $14,000, and that, that players can be fined up to $50,000 for these transgressions. The NFL released a statement late Wednesday saying the primary responsibility for enforcement of the COVID protocols within club facilities rests with each club. The league is aware of the current situation in Green Bay and will be reviewing with the Packers. 
The team quiet tonight after reporters pressed the head coach on Roger's initial comment about being immunized. Do you feel like a call like that might be seen as misleading to fans? It's a great question for Aaron. I'm not going to comment on it. Maura Barrett joins us now from New York. Maura, I don't know if there's a better term to use, but the coach there clearly punting when asked if Aaron Rodgers was indeed vaccinated. So I have to ask you, he used that word immunized. What can we read into this? Well, immunized and vaccinated can have slightly de different definitions, right? So vaccinated means that a vaccine was involved, but immunized means that he could believe that he became immune a different way. And so I say this because ESPN reported that Rodgers had pursued an alternative treatment and petitioned the NFL to recognize him as vaccinated because of that treatment, but the NFL reportedly refused. Tom. All right, Mara Barrett for us tonight. Mara, thank you for that. Now to the latest in that high-profile trial of Elizabeth Holmes. Tonight, her 2018 deposition tapes just obtained by CNBC. The disgraced Theranos found her hardly answering questions, but at one point calling herself the ultimate decision-maker. CNBC's Yasmin Quorum has details. She was the world's youngest self-made female billionaire who was never at a loss for words. But as you'll see, in this nearly four-hour deposition obtained by CNBC, it was a much different Elizabeth Holmes who hardly said anything. Yes. The date, June 27, 2018, just 12 days after Holmes, the founder and CEO of Theranos, and company president Sonny Balwani were indicted on charges of fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Both have pleaded not guilty. No. Listen as Holmes repeatedly takes the fifth on advice of counsel while being deposed by an attorney representing late stage Theranos investors who sued her, the company, and Balwani. Are you going to follow his instruction not to answer? Yes, I'm going to follow my counsel's instruction. I'm going to follow my counsel's instructions. I'm following his instruction. Same instruction. Same response. Holmes won't even acknowledge that it's her when shown an appearance on CNBC's Mad Money. Do you recognize you on that video? Same instruction. That investor lawsuit ended with a confidential settlement. If Holmes does take the stand in her own defense, she won't be allowed to take the fifth, and she'll likely face a barrage of questions from prosecutors about what she told investors and patients. Questions she answered in detail in this SEC deposition from 2017. Did you ever tell investors or potential investors in 2013 or 2014 that Theranos had developed proprietary devices that could conduct all of the blood tests that a central lab could conduct using a few drops of blood and that those devices were ready for patient testing? I don't know that we said it in those words, uh, but generally that was what we were working to do with Minilab going into the FDA in that time frame. Holmes's defense has signaled it's Balwani, her ex-boyfriend, who's to blame, which he strongly denies. But in 2017, Holmes is seen acknowledging that at the end of the day, she was the one in charge. Okay, but were you the decision maker on behalf of Theranos and did you sign the Walgreens contract or the amendment? I, I, I did. I signed many of the Walgreens agreements. I don't know if I signed all of them. Um, and yes, I mean, I'm, I'm the CEO. I'm the ultimate decision maker for the company. All right, Yasmin Quorum joins us now from outside the courthouse there in San Jose. So, Yasmin, I guess the big question at this point and what everyone really wants to know, will Holmes take the stand? Well, attorneys for Holmes did not respond to our request for comment on these tapes or whether she'll testify Inside the courtroom, Elizabeth Holmes has not yet spoken. She wears a mask, so jurors have not seen any sort of emotion from Holmes. This could work in her favor. They could see her as a sympathetic character sitting among her attorneys. Legal experts tell me it's very risky to put Elizabeth Holmes on the stand, but they would do it if they feel like they're losing the case and it could help them. That, of course, would you know, force the government to use her own words against her. And most certainly, these deposition tapes you just saw would come back and haunt her. Tom? All right, Yasmin Quorum making her top story debut. Yasmin, great to have you tonight. We want to turn back to politics after Republicans pulled off a win in the Virginia governor's race this week. All eyes now looking ahead to 2022. Multiple governor's seats up for grabs in key swing states. The influence of former President Trump still looming large. NBC correspondent Von Hilliard spoke with two candidates who are already raising concerns about the legitimacy of the 2024 election.
I think the America First movement has been the most important political movement in this country. This is Carrie Lake. She is at the heart of this story, a candidate for office in 2022 who could throw the U.S. into election chaos in 2024. In the last 24 hours, you said the 2020 election was stolen. Would you have certified Arizona's results? Hell no. Carrie Lake. Whoa. Whoa. Lake, a former Phoenix local news anchor, caught Trump's attention over the summer. Wow. This could be a big night for you. She is now Trump's pick to be Arizona's next governor. This is Trump eyes his own 2024 comeback. He already has a following of candidates like Lake who refuses to say that she would have certified the 2020 election. How close to a constitutional crisis were we? I think we came very close to a constitutional crisis. Trump pressured current Arizona Governor Doug Ducey last year, but Ducey did not back down, even silencing a call from the White House. As he officially signed, and certified Arizona's vote for Biden. Governor Ducey was horrible. He was missing in action. Now Lake is looking to replace him. Doug Ducey should have never certified that. But it's not just Arizona. It's Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. All these swing states have races for governor in 2022. Those states' governors in 2020 all signed off on their state's results. But in 2024? Many of those people those heroes of our democracy in 2020 will be gone in 2024. In Georgia last year, Trump called on the state's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, to resign after he, like Ducey, made Georgia's Biden win official. Then, less than a week later, on the morning of the January 6th insurrection, Donald Trump has just begun. I'm a part of his team, and we're going to take back this country. That man, Vernon Jones, a Georgia legislator taking to the stage in Washington in defense of Trump. He is now running for governor. He's a great guy. He's smart. He's tough. Vernon Jones. I stand for free, fair, and transparent elections. If you were to win the governorship, why should one trust that you would certify the election results in the state of Georgia in 2024 if Joe Biden were to win a re-election or another Democrat? Well, see, that is your narrative. That's what you want to push. But what I am saying to you... But you're not even willing to say that you would certify the 2020 election. I will certify anything that's legal. Some states also require the sign-off of their Secretary of State. Trump trying to influence here, too. In Arizona, backing Mark Fincham, a state legislator who is also outside the Capitol on January 6th and supporting Jody Heiss, who is trying to beat Brad Raffensperger in Georgia. Lake is already making campaign stops. To my second Curry Lake event. This week, Lake throwing what she calls an election integrity rally. November 3rd, we witnessed that steal go down. Multiple reviews in Arizona and Georgia found no major voter fraud that would have impacted the outcome, but no mention of that here. In 2024, would you be willing to put the country into position potentially of a constitutional crisis by not certifying Arizona's results? In 2024? If you were governor, that would come down to I you. Think, I think we need to, let, let's just take it slow here and, and get through decertifying. I think we need to decertify our election right now. I don't want to look into hypotheticals. But still, next year's governor's races with ripple effects for the 2024 presidential election. Let me ask you, Vaughn, would you certify a crooked, corrupt election? Would you certify a crooked, corrupt election? Just to make peace. Yes? No? That's not how I operate. I do what's right. All right, Vaughn Hilliard, questions reversed there. Interesting moment there. He joins us now live from Phoenix. So, Vaughn, I guess the big question is, you know, what happens in 2024 if a governor were not to sign their state's results and certify those elections? Exactly, Tom. That's where it gets murky. I was talking with Adav Nodi. He's a legal director of the Campaign Legal Center. And he said, look explicitly at state statute. In Georgia and Arizona, it says right there that a governor and other statewide officials shall sign and certify their election results. But what if the governor or secretary of state doesn't? Well, that's where it becomes murky. We're also going to be looking, Tom, though, at the county level over the next year. Those county officials are also responsible for certifying their county results this is going to be a major conversation ahead of those 2022 midterms. Tom? All right, Vaughn Hilliard with a great political report there from Arizona tonight. Vaughn, we appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch. And we begin with Russia saying it is tracking a U.S. Navy ship that has entered the Black Sea. 
The Navy says the USS Mount Whitney is in the region to conduct routine maritime operations with NATO alliances. It comes two days after Russia conducted a series of air defense drills and practiced destroying enemy targets in the Black Sea. The Kremlin severed ties with NATO last month. A German charity says it rescued more than 800 migrants from the Mediterranean Sea. The rescue ship was already carrying 400 migrants when it picked up another 400 people from a sinking boat. Several people without life jackets also pulled from the water. The charity is accusing Malta of ignoring the ship's distress call. No word on where the migrants are from, but the area has seen an uptick of people fleeing Libya and Tunisia. And millions of people around the world are celebrating Diwali. Massive crowds seen in countries across Southeast Asia during the multi-day festival of lights. Observers illuminate oil lamps or candles to symbolize the triumph of light over darkness. In India, however, officials are urging people to be cautious of large gatherings over coronavirus concerns. Now to the Americas, a look at the stories coming out of the U.S. and across Latin America. Tonight, we take you to Nicaragua as it braces for a presidential election that world leaders are calling into question. Long-term President Daniel Ortega has cracked down on opposition as his country reels from economic turmoil and political violence. It's the presidential election already being called into question. Nicaragua's president, Daniel Ortega, seeking a fourth consecutive term. If he wins, he'll be the longest serving ruler in the Americas. His wife is vice president. And he's making sure he doesn't lose this race by detaining seven of his opponents, also running for president and jailing countless dissidents. The Biden administration preparing to ramp up sanctions. In a statement, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the Ortega government is preparing a sham election devoid of credibility by silencing and arresting opponents and ultimately by attempting to establish an authoritarian dynasty unaccountable to the Nicaraguan people. Ortega first served from 1984 to 1990 and most recently re-elected in 2007. The 75-year-old now doing everything in his power to crush the opposition most notably eliminating presidential terms and silencing the media. This week, he faced a new obstacle, Meta Platforms. Facebook's parent company said it had removed more than 1,000 corrupt accounts linked to Ortega's government. In a report, they write, this was one of the most cross-government troll operations we've disrupted to date, with multiple state entities participating in this activity at once. Meta Platform saying the accounts were trying to manipulate public discourse by using fake accounts to build personas across platforms and mislead people about who's behind them. The company claims multiple government agencies were contributing to the fake accounts. But these so-called troll farms haven't always been around. The report said they were launched after the massive protests against the government in 2018. The protests were sparked after a move by the government to reduce welfare benefits and erupted into an outcry against Ortega's government and political arrests. The violent clashes resulted in the deaths of more than 300 people. It left thousands injured and put hundreds of protesters in jail. The arrest didn't stop with protesters. Si están viendo este video es porque he sido incomunicado o capturado. This summer, the Ortega administration arrested several presidential challengers, effectively destroying the opposition and campaigning unopposed. I guess you could say that the best way to make sure you win an election is if nobody's running against you. Jorge Castaneda is a professor at NYU and a former board member of the Human Rights Watch and warns the U.S. and other nations need to be strategic in dealing with Nicaragua to prevent an immigration crisis. In Nicaragua, people are suffering. While it makes a lot of sense for the United States and the European Union and others to impose sanctions on Nicaragua for violating a series of international commitments it has on democracy and respect for human rights, those very sanctions can create an even more difficult economic situation, leading to more migration from Nicaragua northward. And we will be covering that election over the weekend. We'll bring you the results on Monday. Coming up, a years-long battle coming to end in New York City. The major win for taxi drivers that will now pull many of them out of crippling debt as the popularity of rideshare apps continues to store, soar. Stay with us. Back now with the major victory for taxi drivers in New York. The city striking a deal to lower crippling debt burdening thousands of cabbies, some of them driven to suicide as the price of medallions skyrocketed. The agreement bringing an end to a weeks-long hunger strike. Our Zinclay Esamois was there in the front seat 
the final days of protest. Cab drivers blocking bridges. We want justice. Elected officials under arrest. And protesters camping outside City Hall and leading a 15-day hunger strike. The reason, mayhem with medallions, the permits allowing taxis to operate in major cities. Now New York reaches a deal after years of cabs calling for change. The city just put me into this nasty, horrible nightmare. Taxi industry leaders promoted medallions while artificially inflating their price. Today, cab drivers are deep in debt after the investments, once worth more than a million dollars, have dwindled in value. The 2014 medallion market crash sent hundreds into bankruptcy. Reports show lenders pocketing millions, leading drivers to dire decisions. I bought this medallion 2006. I have an American dream. I make money. I pay $410,000. Richard, a 63-year-old immigrant driver, and his brother, Kenny, took out loans for medallions, Kenny paying over $700,000. He not make money. He lost everything. He lost investment. He lost retirement. And he committed suicide. That year, at least three taxi drivers took their lives. Workers now also facing stalled business with the pandemic and a surge of ride-hailing apps. I think it's a fight fundamentally about worker dignity. It's also a fight about immigrant justice and racial justice. The New Deal expands a city financial relief program with Marblegate, a primary lender. It includes a city-backed taxi medallion guarantee, $170,000 maximum debt, and a 5% interest rate and capped monthly debt payments. Though not every taxi loan lender is on board, drivers like Richard feel yellow cabs once in the red now face a green light toward hope. All right, Zinclay joins us now from New York. So, Zinclay, how are the drivers you met reacting to the news today? Yeah, Tom, I spoke with drivers and union reps, and overall, they're ecstatic and so excited, not just because debts have been lowered for drivers, but because, as they say, they did not compromise. I spoke with one driver who is a father of four, an immigrant from West Africa, Ivory Coast, and he said he's most glad that they did not yield on demand so that his children don't have to inherit his debts. Of course, after 15 days of hunger strikes, they're also very happy to finally have a meal. Tom. Okay, Zinclair, thank you for that. When we come back, the perfect match. The husband desperately needing a liver, his wife stepping up to save him. Your incredible story next. All right, finally tonight, the gift of life. One Washington man saved by a live liver transplant from his wife. The couple discovering they were a rare match for the surgery, now sharing their story with us. In 2016, college sweethearts Keith and Sarah James made the promise to be with each other in sickness and in health. The couple raising two children in Washington State's beautiful Yakima Valley. The future looked amazing, but there was something in Keith's past that had always troubled him. Ever since college, I've had abnormal liver function tests anytime I get blood work. Months into the pandemic, he received some news that shook his life and his family. So it was summer of 2020 that his specialist told us, I can't tell you when you're going to need a transplant, but I can tell you you're going to need one. Keith was added to the transplant list, but the wait for a liver could take years. So if he had had to wait for a deceased donor, really he very likely would have had to wait a very long time to get a new liver. So he would have had to miss years of our kids' lives because he's sick. His doctors at the University of Washington School of Medicine telling the couple about a rare procedure, live liver donations. Keith had to find someone who had a healthy liver to donate and was a blood type match. His wife immediately raised her hand. And I told him, well, I'm obviously going to get tested. And he was like, no, you're not, because that makes me scared for you. There's always that fear that, you know, something would go wrong and one or both of us could die. But it turns out this couple's love runs deep. Sarah was not only a perfect match as a spouse, but also with her blood type. Dr. Mark Sturdivant was their surgeon. Only about 6% um, of people uh, that undergo live donor transplant in the U.S. It is from a spouse. So it's, it's actually pretty uncommon. Sarah and Keith heading into surgery together, the couple holding hands as Sarah 
saved Keith's life. We are just really thankful that we had this as an option. And I'm really thankful that I could be the one to do it because we just don't know what life would have looked like without it as an option. If you have somebody like Sarah James who comes forward, you can move ahead with transplant in a, in a pretty rapid fashion. And, and that's a huge um, benefit to to really the, the, the recipient as well as the family as a whole. The couple now recovering, but doing it with their children, the family intact, living examples of the power of love and science. And we thank the James family for sharing that story. We thank you for watching. Thanks so much for watching Top Story all week. I'm Tom Yamas in Los Angeles. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.